part of the Press Play Podcast Network. Two weeks in a row, content being provided for your ear holes. This is the Ball Card Show, the sports podcast. Or the sports collector. I'm Jason Otero. I'm Gary Lamaster. That was a very short introduction song. It Did cut you off notice really, that? It cut off really quick. <sighs> I got to do some work on the ones and the twos. <laughs> you know, Isn't get it them, zeros and ones? Get the, no, one twos. That's the like a DJ. Back in the day, oh. disc jockeys. The techniques, the one twos, that's the ones and the two. It's like the disc A and disc disc two. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> the the sign language that you're doing to explain this. I have for the me headphones, but you know, like it's wee, pretty wee, wee, great. Wee, wee, wee. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, uh, I'm good. So, hey, as always, we're brought to you by the Press Play Podcast Network. Uh, well, can I rip the band aid? Do your thing, man. So I'm gonna give Gary the floor here. We're gonna start this off right away. With a recap of what happened in the playoffs, as much as I want to deny him the opportunity to enjoy being correct, which may be his favorite thing, <laughs> even more so than food <laughs> and enjoying the pleasures of life, being correct is up there. So I'm going to let you have the floor. We're going to talk wild card round of playoffs. Have at it, Gary. I mean... All I can say is it's it's good to be good. That's all I can say. Six. That's and all you can say. Well, I can say lots more. Well, six, then go ahead, get it out of your system. Six and zero. Oh, not only six and zero, oh, but damn near every single minute prediction that I made within that turned out to be correct. Uh, now I'll be the first to admit that the chances of that happening two weeks in a row pretty slim especially but, with a couple of the matchups we have this yeah week. but <laughs> we're gonna take up. a shot at it i've got a couple of hot takes when we get there but uh yeah i think that the, the wild card rounds were for the most part the only one that surprised me i thought green bay would win that game i did not expect them to just dog walk the cowboys like that i did not expect i thought they would win i thought it would be a three to seven point game I did not expect them to do what they did. And mm-hmm. that final score is not indicative of how much they dominated the Cowboys. The Cowboys got some trash time scores in late uh, to make the score look more respectable than it was. Like, that was an obliteration. Uh, definitely called the Bucks dog walking the Eagles. The Eagles just stumbled into the playoffs. I have no idea how they were favorites uh, in that game on the road. It made no sense to me whatsoever. Baker Mayfield just lit it up and that team absolutely loves that dude like you can just see it and here's what's crazy about that game man the bucks dropped seven or eight passes in that game mike evans dropped two wide open touchdowns like legitimately baker could have had five touchdowns in that game he dropped a 60 yard dime on mike evans just a dime that he dropped so that was a fun one uh houston winning that game again that game should have been not as close as it was. Uh, C.J. Stroud overthrew Nico Collins for a 70-yard touchdown by eight inches. And this week, we'll see what happens there. But all in all, it was a fun weekend to uh, to be a football fan. It was a lot of fun games. The way that uh, everything shook out was interesting. The Buffalo situation getting bumped to Monday made Monday a really fun day to watch football, too. So you had three days in a row, two games each day. Uh, I don't I don't think it'll happen, but I think that the NFL should look at that going forward anyway. That's all? I think I'm done. Okay, thank you for leaving the fins out of that one. I appreciate that. Uh, the only game that I, I would disagree with it being a fun weekend to watch football. <laughs> uh, I don't want to see – how many blowouts did we have? So we had Browns, Houston, Can- uh, Kansas City, Miami, uh, Dallas – uh, Green Bay, Green Bay, the Bucks also, yeah, and the Bills. What the, was the final score on that one? I don't remember the final score. That game was tight for a little while, but then Buffalo just pulled away. I don't like Josh Allen. I don't like freak. seeing that in a wild card. I like there to be a little more of a fight. Like, hey, this is you know the chance in or the play in. Well, here's why it was fun. Not because it was Lions blowout. was Lions Rams was great. great what game. a great game. The and that game was fun because, like I said, if they hold Kyron Williams, they win the game, and they held Kyron Williams. Thank God they listened to you. You know what I, I mean? know. They, uh, 
Dan Campbell's got me on speed dial. That's all mm-hmm. I can say. Uh, <laughs> um, the thing that was interesting about the weekend and why it was fun, I agree with you. I don't normally like blowouts. But the underdogs were who was doing the blowing out. And that's why it was fun. Uh, the only underdog that didn't participate, to, I guess two underdogs that didn't participate in blowouts, your fins. And that was just, that weather was brutal. And I, there's no way that a team from Miami could be ready for and that. And again, then, I would tell you, six defensive starters out. You, It's hard to do that in the playoffs. Well, here was the thing about that <laughs> game that really blew my mind, and I didn't understand it, and I had a lot of respect for Mike McDaniel as a coach and as a play caller. Early in that game, you guys were running the ball really well. And the game was not out of hand, and they just stopped. You guys stopped trying to run the ball, and it made no sense to me. Like, Tua is obviously not playing well in that game he is obviously being affected by the cold um so why not lean on the running game and they just went away from it they said yeah let's just uh try to throw the ball here and see what happens it didn't work out too well yeah i was really frustrated with it uh and honestly i think they're about to offer him something for five years and it's going to be in the tune of 200 million and uh, i don't know that he's worth that right now no i i'm i don't think it's going to be as bad of a situation as the giants are in with daniel jones but i could see it being a similar situation they're gonna have to pay him because he performed and who else are they gonna get well and he's gonna here's my concern is not will the dolphins continue to make the playoffs i think he will find a way to constantly get us to wild card games because you're gonna beat the teams you should beat. you're gonna play decent against toss-up teams and win half of those games and you're gonna get smoked by good teams which is what his history is and he's got to learn to play under pressure because i don't think he's figured it out no he's very it's looking worse and worse and worse some of these throws you can just see the panic yeah before the ball's even released anyway yeah. i'm still hurt i'm offended uh i have not watched the last three weeks of hard knocks as a result of it <laughs> um i probably will not i'm very disappointed in how the season ended um I did not think this was a Super Bowl team, but I did not think this was a team that would struggle like that to a Kansas City team that in all likelihood will really struggle next week. I think they're going to get smoked yes. by Buffalo. They, they, You watch that game, they they did not play well. Um, so, uh, Browns did not show up defensively. Well, the um, Browns haven't been the same team defensively for the last six weeks. Yeah. Their guys are hurt. Um C.J. Stroud is legit. Uh, there's no other yes. way to say it. And the thing that's the most... trajectory on his throws, that's the one thing I was watching. He stands tall, but that ball is never it's hardly ever flat. Maybe on a five yard route. Yeah. That thing is dropping in. Oh, yeah. Um, well, and, and they attack the spots downfield. He picks. Oh, yeah. They attack downfield. Nico Collins is legit, too. Tank Dell. They would be so much more dangerous right now if Tank Dell hadn't broken his leg six weeks ago. Mm. Um, even then, Noah Brown has stepped in, and C.J. Stroud has made Noah Brown look like a legitimate NFL receiver. That game this week, so what do we have this week? Let's talk about Houston and Baltimore first, since uh, that's mm-hmm. the – everything about this game on paper says that Baltimore should win this game by 10. I think they're nine-point favorites. Mm-hmm. Everything on paper says that Baltimore should win this game by 10. I got a weird feeling about it, though. Yes, but it being in Baltimore is a thing. I, I don't disagree. Especially with this team. But I'll, you know what else I think is a real thing? Until he proves me wrong, playoff Lamar Jackson's a real thing, too. And he's yeah. not very good. Let's also – let's just pull up the weather here. Um, the game's uh, Saturday, 4.30. Um, oh, I, it's going to be cold. Yeah, I'm wondering if they're going to be getting this weather still. There's also – I've heard there's a chance, and I don't think it's real – but there is a chance that Mark Andrews might be available for this game, which would make a big difference. I have heard that he is available. Yeah, that would that would make yeah. a big difference if he's available for this game tomorrow. It does a lot, especially just on the blocking front. That's a huge deal. But yeah, he's a he's a weapon. He's yeah. a weapon. Uh, and not that Isaiah Likely has been bad uh, it, replacing him. Isaiah Likely has actually been pretty good. All right, here's the here's the forecast. Yep. Okay, sunshine and clouds mixed, so that that's definitely a factor. Yep. Um, high of twenty seven. Winds 10 to 20 miles an hour. So, 
that's gonna if, if that's a Baltimore that situation that favors Baltimore. Baltimore. Now here's what I think. But that momentum mm-hmm. piece and the yeah. when your eyes are studying a team like Houston, they look really good right now. I I'm really excited about. There's two games I'm really excited about. That one, and then definitely uh, the Niners-Packers game. Yeah. Uh, so the the Baltimore-Houston game, here's what I I'm giving you. Baltimore the edge on that still. I think Baltimore wins the game. It wouldn't shock me if Houston wins, but if you put a gun to my head, I'm picking Baltimore to win. However, I think there is money to be made in the betting markets on betting on Houston to cover. Mm. Like, if you can get nine points, I think that's a worthwhile bet to make. But I'm picking Baltimore to win that game. It wouldn't shock me if Houston pulls out a stunner because Lamar Jackson has shown in the playoffs that he can be rough. Um, let's jump down to uh, Niners-Packers. Okay. Um, I'll go first because I think you're going to have a different opinion. Okay. Uh, for similar reasons as the last one. Um, but I'm going to go with Niners on this one. They're home again. Um, I – never underestimate how terrible the Cowboys are in the playoffs. And we have watched several Dallas games. That was nowhere close to their peak performance this season. Right. Um, For those reasons, even with all the momentum the Packers have and how good they look offensively, they really, really look good. I still think the Niners get past them. I think there's a defensive edge for them. See, uh, as much as the Packers' offense looked good against Dallas, their defense impressed me more. Um, I think the Niners win. I think it's a much closer game than people think that it is. And I will say, again, much like my Houston uh, Baltimore thought process, I'm not going to have a heart attack if Green Bay goes in and wins that game. Um, historically, Green Bay has gotten to Super Bowls by going into San Francisco and winning games. So it, it wouldn't blow my mind, but I, I think it's a safe bet that the that the Niners win and probably cover. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that's a seven and a half or eight point game right now, and I think that the Niners probably win by two touchdowns. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that Green Bay will play reasonably well. I think Jordan Love will play reasonably well. I think that they are not going to move the ball the way they did against Dallas, and I don't think they're going to stop what San Francisco does mm-hmm. the way they stopped what Dallas mm-hmm. does. Now, if we get to halftime and that's a lower scoring game, uh, and that's a, all bets are off. Yep. There. But I do think, you know, just like, you know, I said that last week about Miami, if they don't have 10 points at the half, they don't have a chance. Well, that, that turned out to be yeah, you know, a big deal. Yep. Um, all right. This next one, whew, I'm cheering for both teams, but I do think the Lions have shown. So Bucks Lions in Detroit, the Lions – like the Bucks, have shown a willingness and desire to just scrap out and figure out the win, however it needs to happen. But I think that there seems to be less variance with the Lions, and for that reason, I think they're going to pull together a consistent game. I think it's going to be very similar to last week's Lions game. I think it's going to be a close game. Uh, I think that it's going to come down to two things. If Baker is able to play the way he did last week and have the time that he had last week, I think the Bucs can win that game. Mm-hmm. Flip side of that coin is the Bucks are going to blitz Jared Goff's balls off. That's what they do. They blitz 40 to 45% of their snaps. If mm-hmm. the Lions can handle that blitz, they're going to walk them because I don't think Tampa Bay can stop what they do offensively. Right. This is a game I think could be a pretty high-scoring game, mm-hmm. but I think they're going to be trading scores, and whoever has the ball last yeah. probably wins. I don't know what the over is, but I'm, I'm probably taking it on that one. Yeah, but I'm with you. I, I think the Lions probably have the edge there. Uh, the next game, two teams that, in my opinion, now let me, let me preface this. They've both taken on Miami and beat them at every opportunity this year. Right. I, th- I still think both these teams should not be this far into the playoffs. Um, we disagree, but that's okay. I don't like the Bills or the Chiefs here. Um, I give Bills the edge just because of how disorganized the Chiefs seem to be offensively, which was never a thing. Like, I they, they seem to click and figure it out, and they look rough they, out there. They have one receiver. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I, know, I understand all that. And the offensive line uh, hasn't been great, so I – this is the one game this week that I think is a blowout. 
You think the Bills destroy? I think it's. I, ugly. I would agree when I, I think look it's at it ugly. As close. I, I I think that you're going to see a Patrick Mahomes meltdown on the sideline. Ravens has a potential for that if something weird happens with CJ Stroud. Yeah, if, if Stroud he's gets off, hurt or if yeah. he's just off with everything. But. The thing with him is, I, he's not been off. He, he's not emotional. Oh, no, yeah. Yeah. like that's. He would have to get hurt, but this is the this Buffalo Kansas City game is the one game that I think is just a smoke. Like if there's an alternate line at like plus two fifty for Buffalo by ten, I but bet this that. is also historically the exact scenario where the Bills have lost in the playoffs. Yeah, but they've never Repeatedly. had it at home. They've never had it at home. Yeah. They've always been on the road. And here's the thing about the Buffalo: Buffalo finished the season eleven and six. Right. And people were like, this is a disappointing year. And they struggled here and there. But you know what they did? They were six and one against playoff teams Mm -hmm. and beat them handily. They didn't just like kind of beat those playoff teams. They smoked them. Buffalo this year struggled against teams that they should beat. And I think that's a mental thing. But they get up for the games that matter. Um, Since Ken Dorsey got fired, they went seven and one. They're six and one. Josh, the run Josh Allen had last week, that 52 yard touchdown run where he just hard juked two safeties and then trucked somebody and went to the end zone and outran the entire defense. That's Josh Allen is one of the, he and Patrick Mahomes and and you're seeing right now with Mahomes that he's struggling to do it. Josh Allen might be the only guy in the league who can pick an entire team up and put them on his back and go, okay, you guys aren't catching it today. I guess I need to run for one twenty and three tutties. Yeah. Well, they really haven't done that well against playoff teams, uh, except for the Cowboys. Um, a lot of these are closer than that. So the last Chiefs was a three-point game. Um, Miami, seven-point game. Uh, Touchdown games. Of- Eagle, three-point game. That was in, that was early in the Eagle season, though, right? No. When was that? Uh, week one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Week twelve, so at that point the Eagles were ten and two, no ten and one. They were ten and one at that point. Yeah, but what I'm saying is they weren't dog walking them like you're saying. So i I am not I am not convinced that the Bills are as explosive. They have a reputation for that when you have Josh Allen. I don't think this season has shown that, but KC looks way worse than eleven and six in my opinion. Agreed. So. It'll be interesting to see what happens there. The chemistry issues, whatever's going on with Travis Kelsey. I mean, a lot of drop passes, but again, like you said last week, they were throwing shot oh, I mean, it's, it's hard to catch that. So It's hard to throw it, too. Yeah. So, anyway, that's our recap. Take that advice for what you will. Um, so, we agreed on everyone the, the lines on all that okay yeah cool um, yeah we we d- disagreed about some of the potentialities but as far as what we we're actually picking i think we're all on the same page are you excited to talk a little bit of baseball i'm gonna give you a little bit you uh, yeah, not a lot fine. of bit just you, you you fire there's at me? snow on the ground i'll talk about it oh there's snow on the ground and stink in the air thanks man yep um let's talk about a few moves offseason moves you may have heard of it show of tony went to la yeah so well, there, there's LA, but. everybody that's listened to this already knows what's going on there. Um, the one thing about that contract that I think MLB is going to have to address at some point is the deferred money. Uh, they're going to have to put some kind of a rule in place that caps the percentage of deferred dollars. Otherwise, teams like the Dodgers and the Yankees are going to throttle the free agent market even more yeah. than they already have. Double like the, down. Yeah. The Dodgers are are deferring. 680 million of the 700 million dollars and for otani that's super smart he's making plenty of money yeah, between bobby Bonilla and them. everything else well not bobby Bonilla's is getting a million a year he's going to be getting 15 20 mm-hmm. 30 million a year for the rest of his life mm-hmm. like okay that's all you got <laughs> I, I mean <laughs> what else are you going to say about otani he's the best player in baseball yeah. when he's healthy yeah. uh he's not going to pitch this year but as a hitter if he's not worried about pitching, watch what happens this year. He's going to hit 40 jacks and steal 40 bases. Mm-hmm. I'll tell you that much. Mm-hmm. Dude is fast. Yep. Uh, Yamamoto. The other big prize in free agency, international free agency, uh, again, to the Dodgers. They did not defer this contract. Have you watched this dude pitch? Have you watched his Yeah, overlays? I sent you one of those. Yeah. His over. He's filthy. Mm-hmm. He is that fork. Mm-hmm. Is gonna break people off, mm-hmm. like it's gonna be. 
his sequencing is going to be nuts. He's going to be like high inside fastball, high inside fastball, take it for a ball, no problem. Slider that starts there, drops away, back to a fastball, and then he's going to throw a fork in the middle of the zone that looks like the fastball until it drops 19 inches into the dirt, and guys are going to fall down. Swing on something to hit you in the foot. Oh, it's going to be ugly. <laughs> like, he is good. Yeah. Uh, and I know there's a history of guys coming over pitching wise that don't meet expectations. I don't think that's going to be the case mm-hmm. with this kid. Yeah. Uh, he's he's nasty. Uh, then we have uh, speaking of powerhouse programs that blow tons of money. You got Stroman going to the Yanks. That was a weird one. So I will give this to Marcus Stroman. He is a dude who has parlayed two borderline all-star seasons into big money twice now. Um, I don't think he's, at, at best, in my opinion, Marcus Stroman's a three. He's a solid three at best. In an average year, he's a bottom tier four. In a bad year, he's a swing man. And the Yankees just dropped big money on him. And it surprised me because he and Cashman have had issues in the past. Um, I guess they hammered that out, but... If the Yankees are thinking Marcus Stroman's going to shore up that rotation, mm. I just don't see it. Not like, enough. No, and 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 he he's not a big ground ball pitcher, so bringing guys that aren't big ground ball pitchers into Yankee Stadium, ew, mm-hmm. yeah, I don't. I mean, that short porch makes it tough for those guys, and he's been losing velocity for three years now so it's not like he's gonna be touching 99 anymore he's mm-hmm. probably gonna sit 94 and touch 97 two ticks is a lot in major leagues mm-hmm. it is yeah. not a signing that i was a big fan of uh we still have a couple free agents out there we don't know what's going to be happening with them we have bellinger and we have blake snell um now bellinger is one that i'm gonna pull up what, he, what did last year amazing yeah. he, he he so Again, I've had this conversation with people about Cody Bellinger. If you're if you're not a big baseball person, you're just a peripheral baseball person. Let me explain to you Cody Bellinger's career in a nutshell. Rookie of the year, MVP, four-time All-Star in seven seasons. Okay? The list of humans who have won Rookie of the Year and an MVP is very short. Mm-hmm. They're all in the Hall of Fame. It's very short. The thing about Bellinger is he got hurt, and then his swing didn't adjust from that, and he had about a year and three quarters where he was a bad hitter. He was still a really good fielder, still gold glove caliber fielder, Mm -hmm. but he was a bad hitter. And the Dodgers gave up on him, and he signed a $17 million one-year deal uh, with Chicago last year. You want to uh, read off that slash line real quick because it's pretty impressive. Well, 4.4 war. Yeah. 499 at bats, 153 hits, 26 jacks, and hit 307 on the year. Yeah, and and he missed about 30 games. Mm-hmm. And he played three positions. Mm-hmm. Um, I think at this point in his career, he's going to settle in as a first baseman slash corner outfielder. I think his center field days are done, which is fine. But um, Guys, he's not 35. He's 28. Yeah, that's so, my point. He's, yeah, he's young. Yeah. He's still got a decade of high performance. What was the injury game. last year? Uh, I don't remember what it was last year, but he missed about a total of about 30 games, two yeah. different times on the deal. But if he plays a full season last year, he's a five-and-a-half war player, maybe a six-war player. He hits 35 jacks. He hits over 300. Mm-hmm. He's got 110 RBIs. He's in the MVP com- conversation. So, Who could you see making a play on him? Oh, uh, the Yankees are probably the – and they're a great fit for his swing. How big is that contract? He probably signs for 28, 29 mil a year for five years. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's I a, don't think he'll get more than five years. He, no, I don't either, but he's a Scott Boris client. So Boris is notorious for waiting till the last minute to try to milk every mm-hmm. last penny out of a contract. So, And Bellinger doesn't have to worry about not getting signed somewhere. Right. Um, I, I think the Yankees make a lot of sense. Uh, he's not going back to the Dodgers. That bridge is burned. I think the Cubs would love to re-sign him. I just don't know whether they're going to want to spend mm-hmm. that kind. Of, I think for him, for his career, that might be the best thing that yeah. could happen to yeah. him. Because while the Cubs are a big baseball market and their fan base is huge, 
they don't have the scrutiny from the national media that the Yankees, the Dodgers, mm-hmm. you know, teams like that have. And the media in Chicago is not the media in New York. Right. And he's proven to be a guy who, you know, sometimes that level of scrutiny was tough for him to deal with. So I think he might even like to stay in Chicago. It's just a question of whether Chicago is going to pony up the way Boris wants him to. Mm-hmm. All right. And then Blake Snell, somebody's going to pay him. Somebody's going to overpay him. And yes, 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 I know he's won two Cy Young Awards. Cool. Uh, he's a really good pitcher. Cool. Uh, he's not Justin Verlander. He's not Clayton Kershaw. He's not Max Scherzer. But he's going to get that kind of money, and somebody's mm-hmm. going to make a mistake giving him that kind of money. His underlying, Who needs him that has that money? Oh, there's a few. I mean, Arizona would love to sign mm-hmm. him. Um, I think that the Giants would love to sign mm-hmm. him. I just don't know that they're go- whoever signs him is not going to get what they're paying for. And it's because his underlying metrics are so swingy. Mm-hmm. His underlying metrics say that he should be a 20% worse pitcher than he is. He just gets a lot of uh, – mm-hmm. luck is the wrong word because in professional sports you make your own luck a lot of times. But it's a lot like a hitter when you see a hitter who's got a low batting average but their batting average on balls and play is ridiculously low. It's just mm-hmm. unlucky sometimes. Blake Snell gets lucky a lot of times. So whatever team signs him, I think Blake Snell's, what, 29? So at this point, you're signing a pitcher that's not on the level of those guys that have shown they can pitch into their 40s at a super high level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's won two Cy Young Awards, but the Cy Young Award anymore is a little bit watered down, in Mm -hmm. my opinion. It's not going to end up being a great signing for whoever signs him. Okay. Um, I'll start thinking about baseball whenever the snow's melted. <laughs> well, we were having that. So one of the fantasy baseball leagues I'm in, that's a, uh, a really cool league, a fun league to be in. They started talking the other day about setting a draft date and people are like, what about January? I'm like, dude, let's wait till pitchers report. Mm-hmm. Like, can we at least wait till pitchers report? So we have an idea. Like that mm-hmm. would be great if we could do that. So I'm always thinking about baseball, but I'm with you about thinking about it super hard. Yeah. <laughs> baseball nuts are a different breed. Um, Okay, how about we talk some hobby? I think let's that's, talk hobby between last week and this. It's about an hour and a half with very little hobby talk. Okay, let's talk. Uh, hobby. I mean, these sports podcast for these sports collector collector. So let's let's run into that. A couple of topics that we want to talk about. First off, we're going to have a new challenge this year. Uh, if you've been with us for several years, you remember the first time we did a challenge like this. It was like a trade up challenge or flip challenge, whatever we call it. But I basically sat on a Zion Williamson 10. Did nothing. <laughs> well, it just depreciated and I couldn't trade it because we started with a card. This year we're back with a different approach. Uh, we're going to, we're going to have our own ball card show 5k. The goal is the goal is that by the end of this season, which should be right around Thanksgiving. Yep. Um, 2024 Gary and I will hopefully have taken a $100 investment in a card and sold it and bought and sold and bought and sold and bought and sold and bought and sold and bought our way up to five grand at the end of the year. That's the goal. It may or may not happen. So to motivate me, I could lose money. Right. So here's how this is going to work. Uh, Gary and I are both going to start with $100 each. Buy a card, sell a card. Buy a card, sell a card. All right? Yeah, no trading. We're not trading. We're buying and selling. Um, at the end of the season, whoever has the least amount of value as far as comps go. So let's say Gary has a $7,000 card and I have a $4,000 card, okay? I have to either sell that outright and give Gary 25% of the value of that card or I can keep the card and give him 25% of comps. Of the value, yeah. So there's a little money on it, but I can't lose more than 100 bucks. <laughs> this works. Right, the, stra- the strategy should be interesting. But yeah, so the thought process is that, and, and we're trying to be realistic about it because Jason is while he's part of the hobby and collects and sells and sets up at shows here and there, he is not anywhere near as deep as no. I am. No, um, I'm not doing uh, every eight, week shows. six to eight days a month or a month in shows. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I am. And that being said, a lot of that can be made up. But yeah, like Jason said, to, to clarify a little bit more, a hundred dollar bill to start. Our goal is to buy the best card we can buy for a hundred bucks and then sell it for more than we paid for it, and then just keep doing it. And what we're going to do to keep ourselves accountable and keep you guys as listeners involved is every transaction, we got to bring receipts. If I, if I do a transaction at a show, I got to take a picture of it 
with the mm-hmm. cash. You know, I buy something, the same thing. And we will post that to our socials. We will keep you guys involved. And, hey, if you guys want to get involved and you see something that we bought that you want to buy, reach out to us. Mm-hmm. We'll keep you guys involved that way. You're Absolutely. welcome to buy from us. And if you uh, if you got stuff you want to sell, mm-hmm. let us know. And we will get involved in that way too. But it's one card at a time. No lots. You can't take your $100 and buy 10 cards. You're buying one card mm-hmm. at a time. Now, correction, you can buy a lot, but you can only use one card. In that, your... Yes, that's that's so true. down the road, if I buy a lot of cards for 1000 because there's a card in there worth 1500 Yes. One, that would be a smoking deal, which it does happen. Yes. But uh, you can only play that one card. You can't sell out the rest of that as part of the deal. Correct. Um, let's talk strategies for just a second. Yeah. So one of my thoughts will be i think ultra modern will be a little bit more unavoidable on the front end for me um and then as the values go up i'm going to move away from ultra modern um it's going to be hard not to be a fan of certain genres right or eras uh but i want to move into things with less volatility as the year goes on however you know if something pops off with baseball or July, somebody gets called up and they are killing it, and that Bowman first is there, and now's the time to make that money. I might do that. Uh, I'm going to try to avoid that a little bit um, yeah. to protect myself against the and, Zion thing happening again. And part of it is the hedge of how long do you want to hold something. And that's the thing. If you hold something for more than a week at a time, that's fine. We still have to address it and talk about it. But that may be a strategy. Maybe. Maybe you buy a card, maybe your fourth card, you spend 500 bucks on something that you think might be worth two grand in a month. Mm-hmm. If it's a Bowman first ultra modern guy that turned like Jackson holiday stuff last year did that, like it five X. Um, maybe that's part of the strategy, but it's also risky because if it doesn't pan out yeah. now, you're stuck. Yeah. Now you might, and there might be weeks where you go, okay, I, I might, I'm at 500 bucks, right? And I bought a card that I thought was worth six fifty, and I paid five hundred bucks for it. And the best offers I'm getting are four eighty. You might have to take a step back sometimes. Hmm. Like you might have to take a loss here or there just to keep yourself going forward. And that's p- one of the things about the hobby that's really important. I think a lot of people don't understand. Liquidity matters. And if you bought a card for five hundred bucks, thinking you were going to make profit on it, do not fall into the sunk cost fallacy you may need to sell that card for 400 because if you don't it might only be worth 200 three weeks from now and then you know i took a hundred dollar loss but now i can take that 400 and try to get that back Mm -hmm. um don't don't do the whole zion thing where you just hold it till it's not worth squat it went from 100 to 20 dollars yeah in like a month and a half and i was like hey he'll be back it was in direct correlation to his weight and the <laughs> hobby crashing. Yeah. I mean, correcting. I mean, crashing. I yeah. mean, correcting. Uh, so we're going to give that a try. Here's where I think, and, and the only pushback I gave Gary was, I think he drastically underestimates how many transactions that would take and how long it'll take to make that many transactions to get to 5K. Give me a ballpark guess of how many transactions it would take to go from 100 to 5K. Let's assume it's single cards. Well, if I'm able to do it the way that I do right now within my business. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm going to be running early on. I'll be running 35 to 40% margins. And then as it gets higher, I'll get down to about 20% Mm -hmm. margins. So I think realistically, it's probably going to be 20 transactions, maybe Mm -hmm. 25. I think you can double that number to try to get where you're going. I don't. I mean, you're, you're talking about 10, you're talking about less than 10% margins to do that. Mm -hmm. Uh, If I'm only running 10% margins, I quit. I won't do this. And you think you'll have an update? fairly regularly like within the week um two weeks at the most but yeah i think a transaction a week is probably especially if you're focusing on the right kind of stuff that moves quick so you're saying that once you get started you should be hitting this goal around july to august yeah that's my thought process if that works stop setting up at card shows well, no, because it, again, you still have to set up. A, you're talking about one card. So if if I go from a hundred to five grand, that means I'm averaging a grand a month. That's not enough to stop setting up at card shows. Mm-hmm. Not even close. Mm-hmm. I mean, but if you did that with like twenty cards. Well, yeah, but it's harder to do with twenty cards than it is with one. 
Okay. Yeah. Interesting. I am a pessimist, but you will see me try. And who knows what will happen. The way I see it is... The effort is what's going to matter yes, for you. A hundred percent. If you just kind of fluff around with it, you won't have any success. All right. Speaking of negativity, let's talk about the current state of breaking in the hobby. Um, wow. It's different than it was. Even one year ago, definitely... How many years has it been since the big boom? Three now? Yeah, we're Coming up three, three and a half. Yeah. So... I'll be honest with you, it doesn't, I don't do it very much anymore, um, especially compared to even two years ago. Right. Um, when I hop on these platforms that have the live breaking, the big ones, you know, whatnot, Fanatics Live. Excuse me, I'm yawning. It's the morning still. Well, actually, it's just afternoon. Um, it's kind of a ghost town. Like, there's a lot of people that used to snap fill that sit around shuffling cards begging for people to buy a spot. There are a lot of breaks, these like where the products are not great. Like they're doing these mixers and it is not a good combination. Right. It's clear that people are having issues sourcing and all that. So I just want to jump into breaking and talk about what is happening with it and what it means for the hobby. So at the very minimum, it seems like the breaking activity has slowed down. At the very least, there is less traffic in the spaces that were snap filling breaks all day long a couple years ago. Well, for, for sure. And there's there's two reasons for that, in my opinion. One, the value of base cards has tanked, right? So, you know, two, three years ago, let's use, at, at the time, the hottest sport out there in late 2020 into early 2021 was NBA, Right. Because people were chasing Zion and John and Luca. Base cards from those guys from desired products. I mean, base prisms of Zion were 200 bucks, right? Uh, base cards are not pulling those kind of dollars anymore. So, knowing that base cards aren't pulling those kind of dollars anymore, you know, going into a break, that there's a, it used to be you hit the Pelicans in a case break of prism you were going to get a couple of zion bases mm -hmm. and you might be in the pelicans for 1200 bucks but you knew you were at least going to get 25 or 30 percent of that back worst case scenario yeah if you get something the nine yeah. or better then yeah. yeah and even then like guys like at the time like Nikhil alexander walker yeah, no, was and um uh who's the other kid that was there the the center Oh, shoot. You know who I'm talking about. Yeah. Those guys were selling their bases were selling for three to five bucks a piece and their <laughs> silvers were 50 yeah. to 80. So you were going to get 40, 45 percent of your money back. Worst case. And if you hit big, you were going to quadruple mm -hmm. what you were getting. Now, breakers are still trying to charge the same margins. Mm hmm. But there's a 95% chance that you're going to get smoked and flush your money. Now, you have a better chance by three or four times taking that $1,000, going to your casino, putting it all on a blackjack hand, mm -hmm. and calling it a day. Yeah. So that's a lot of the problem that I see is that breakers are – the singles market has adjusted and the price of product hasn't. And then you combine the fact that breakers are still marking product up to 300% a lot of times. The only people that I break with anymore uh, are Facebook guys that I've known for years that aren't trying to get rich doing it. Um, and part of the problem is, is that these breaking organizations uh, from Backyard Breaks to um, Layton to Break Club, to they've created operations where they have employees, and multiple things going on from shipping departments and everything else, those organizations were built on two to three hundred percent margins. Mm -hmm. Well, it's hard to fill breaks now. One, disposable income levels are down. Two, people have moved on to other things. The the pass through people in the hobby, like the sneaker heads that went from flipping shoes to flipping retail mm -hmm. have moved on to the next thing. So those guys aren't bringing big dollars to the table anymore. So you're trying to fill these breaks at crazy prices 
and it's taking you a long time. And, and you were talking about it earlier. Guys like Backyard are barely breaking new product anymore. They're creating their own repack products and focusing on that because and why? that's where they can make why? margins. You're guaranteed your margin on that. Yes. You're guaranteed your margin. Um, it just takes the excitement out of it for me. And just even the way people would get excited in a break, like the dialogue during breaks isn't there like that was for the hobby. Yeah. People were excited. People were like, oh, that's sweet. Like inserts. And maybe it's just because those random inserts were 10 or 20 bucks. Now right. they're 2 or $3. Well, you, you've been to Vegas a lot of times, right? Yeah, more than I should have. So in Vegas, when you go to the big fancy casinos on the strip with the tourists, there's mm-hmm. a level of excitement and, mm-hmm. and people are, you know, whatever. But if you go to the off strip mm-hmm. casinos, it's depressing and sad. You mm-hmm. see old people gambling their social security money because they're addicts, mm-hmm. right? That's what's happening with breaking. To me, you got guys who are gambling. They're not collectors. They're gamblers. Mm-hmm. And it's a constant juggle of chasing lost money. Mm-hmm. Like, one of the things that I've committed to this year is to break even less than I did last year. And I didn't do it a lot last year. If I spend a hundred bucks a month in breaks last year, it was a heavy month for me. Mm -hmm. Um, My commitment to myself this year is I'm going to even do less than that. Because again, if I take that same hundred bucks and just go buy stuff to resell, my chances of coming out ahead are way better Mm -hmm. than jumping into a break. Now, baseball wise, I'll still do player case breaks, of low end guys that I think have high upside because I can do that cheap and stock up on stuff. But rather than taking, you know, 12, 13, 15, two grand, I know guys that spend two, three, four grand a month on breaks. I would much rather buy my own cases mm-hmm. and either hold those or rip those to sell the singles from. Like I'm going to have a much better chance of coming out ahead yeah. in that scenario. Yeah. Yeah, the the pushing of the repacks, the mixers sometimes are so random, and all they're trying to do is to, it's almost like if it's confusing enough, then people think, well, surely I can't take a loss if I have this football, this basketball, and this baseball team. Right. Well, Um, most of the time when you see those mixers, there's one decent product, and they're trying to get rid of a bunch of shit products. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, Allocations is a conversation, too, so we've talked about several times. Um the market was allowing for people to go scoop retail off of the shelves and break a mixer of blasters and megas of retail product and still mark up two to 300. The market isn't there for us. It doesn't support it. People have to get real allocations, which that game has even changed a little bit or their yes. third, you know, they're having to get it on the secondary market and it's marked up so high that they're still expecting, like you said, two to 300% on that. Um, why? Because they've, created an operation with a significant amount of overhead. Right. Like, if I was doing this right now, I would be like, how big of an audience can I build to do three breaks a week consistently in my own basement, ship everything out of here? What can I handle with my time myself? And what's what's a reasonable amount of money to make off of that? And I think you'll have more of that happening. The problem is it's going to be a wasteland when it comes to product. Right. Um, well, and that's and that's the thing that a lot of people have to keep in mind too. Like there's there's this balance between the wax market and the breaking market mm-hmm. and the singles market. If breaking dies, which I don't think it'll ever die, but if it drastically slows down, the singles market gets really interesting because those guys that are buying into breaks are who is feeding the singles market. Mm-hmm. It's I tell this story all the time, my the way I did Anthony Volpe back in 2020, people were buying into Bowman breaks, chasing Jason Dominguez. And I would just reach out when I saw a big case break on Facebook and I saw whoever bought the Yankees, I would send them a DM. Hey, uh, I know you got the Yankees in this break. Are you chasing Dominguez? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, if you hit any Volpe or any Everson Pereira that you want to sell quick, just hit me up afterwards and Mm -hmm. I'm buyer. Mm -hmm. Um, And I just stocked up. On Volpe stuff. I was mm-hmm. buying base autos for 15, 20 bucks. Mm-hmm. They sold for 600 bucks a piece last year at the peak. Like, so at the end of the day, if that singles market gets drier because product isn't getting opened as much, there's this really delicate balance that occurs between the two. 
when you have an oversupply of singles, singles prices drop, which is what's happened to base. Mm -hmm. But if you have an undersupply, it moves. And then obviously one of the things in this hobby more than anything else in the in any other hobby you can have in a pure buying and selling marketplace supply and demand rules the day mm -hmm. lower the supply higher the demand higher the price mm -hmm. in this hobby that isn't the case one of the most overproduced products on planet earth is panini prism football and basketball they make as much of that as tops does of series one baseball Yet, those prism, base, and color cards command drastically higher prices than things that actually have low mm -hmm. print runs. Yeah. And it's because the market has decided that prism rules. Mm -hmm. So you can't just play the supply and demand game. I remember a couple years ago, we talked about this. I had that Kyler Murray to 25 mm -hmm. and an SGC 10. At the, at the time, Kyler Murray stuff was hot. And I could not move that card for less than the price of a PSA 10 base prism color. Mm -hmm. Murray. And it made no sense to me. I, I could not get my brain wrapped mm -hmm. into that. So if as you're buying things and looking at stuff, keep in mind that not only supply and demand, but perception of products matters too. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, so the allocation, it's twofold. So it seems like Fanatics is looking at these potential distributor, distributors, breakers. For their platform. Brands for their platform. And if it's not a great match for them on their platform, there goes your allocations. It could be somebody that move, can move a lot of product, but it does seem like they actually care if they are a good match for the platform. I could be wrong. There are people that think that Fanatics is just, you know, Panini 2.0, uh, which could, like, they're positioned to be able to do that if they want to. Um but it really seems like they're trying to push their platform. Um, well, the one thing that I've seen on their platform. Which, by the way, I've been on that platform several times. I'm like, there's not nearly as much going on here as I thought there would be. No, not yet. There will be. But here's, here's why I think that's the case. One, since they're the manufacturer and they're providing a breaking platform and a sales platform, there's going to be price controls, right? Like the leeway that guys have to mark stuff up is not going to be as strong because they don't much like anything else. When I go to McDonald's on West broad and I pay five eighty nine for this combo meal and I go to, you know, McDonald's in Dublin, I might expect to pay $6 and 30 cents instead of five eighty nine, but I don't expect to pay $12. Right. And so there's going to be some of that where where Fanatics is going to try to keep people within their MSRP plus shipping and a little bit of profit. They also, I think the more than a match for their platform, I think they are concerned about how they treat the end customer. Is hmm. shipping done in a timely manner? Mm -hmm. Do you have any scandals in your past that indicate that you might screw people? That's why Backyard Breaks isn't on Fanatics. Backyard Breaks has had so much bad pub. Yeah in the hobby that they don't want any part of that. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, um, so those are all things that come into that factor, but I'm within the next four or five years, fanatics is going to have cornered just about every piece of this market. They're going to have their fingers and toes into everything, but local shows. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, um, so what does breaking look like a year from now? I think it, it looks the same. I think prices will be down some, and I think that it will take longer to fill things. Um, I think that the, the, the margin question is what comes into play. Do breakers adjust to a volume model, or do they stick with a margin model? Here's what I think happens. I think a year from now, a lot of guys are going to be out of the game and on to the next quick dollar. Oh, for sure. Um, because of that, I think you have some of these brands of breakers that have built out companies. And here's what I do respect. There was not like a clear laid out path in this industry for people to take their business from breaking on Facebook to the shop. Right. And I'll give an example of that. Um, you know, one of the first groups I ever got in was one out of San Antonio with a guy named Victor 
who would do like dollar rolls for singles. Yeah. Um, and little by little, it grew, built an audience. He wanted a business. He's got a brick and mortar. Hey, from what I just, just saw, kicking. he's he just got whatever the seal of approval is from Fanatics Tops and all yeah. that, where he's going to be an, an actual you know distributor. Yep. Um, that story's awesome, but there weren't a lot of like easy business models to create that off of. Right. It was kind of an old man's game for a long time. Yep. Um, in Ohio, we have a few of those shops, guys, that just had allocations forever. And because of how much wax they have, they just, they have the audience. What I think is going to happen is you're going to have people who haven't quite made it to that point yet that bail out because it's going to get too expensive for them. If you're expecting two to 300% on high dollar items, you're going to have to go find something else. There is a niche out there. There is a quick flip, but it's probably not breaking because it's going to look like a lot of work. Right. Uh, your overhead is going to be too much. Um, if you're continuing to make those margins, it's going to be hard for Fanatics not to say, hey, I want some of that. Well, that's uh, Fanatics is kind of controlling those yeah. margins on yeah. their platform because they don't want, they want the experience to be the same from a price. I, I, I mean. Well, here's what I'm getting at then. I think, let's say there were 50 big breakers. I think next year, 20 to 25, but they are so much larger than they are right now because they are being chosen. And because of that, the only positive will be I, I the only thing I disagree with is I think breaks will fill faster because there's gonna be fewer people. Yeah. Um so it's gonna be Walmart, right? We're right. no longer going to the boutique, we're going to right. Walmart. Ugh, I don't love that. Um I think it's gonna fetch a premium, but I think it can also create a better experience for the enthusiast that loves breaking. These aren't all gambling addicts. <laughs> no there's an attraction for the gambling addict, but there are people that have the resources, it is disposable income, and they just love to get a little bit of whatever's those, just come out. Those people are the people that are buying into national treasures. And sure, flaw, sure. And flawless breaks yeah. and opulence breaks yeah. and tops transcendent breaks. Mm -hmm. They're not grinding like we are the, trying the, to. The, yeah. the guys buying into top series one breaks, buying the big teams, Yeah, that's silly. Yeah, yeah. yeah like if, you, if, if you're if top series one pre-order started this week, when those start breaking, the reds are going to be expensive as all get out. Um, if you're buying the reds in top just series buy a one, case. Well, yeah, you're, if you're buying those guys in top series one, you're out of your mind. If you're breaking top series one as somebody in the hobby, you're kind of just you're just flushing money down the toilet. Yeah, I do love it though. <laughs> For me, it's like officially. I like that dopamine. Well, it's officially baseball season. Like that's like that's like yeah. But like you said, yeah. let's just buy a yeah. case and rip just it ourselves. Buy a case, yeah. Um, so anyway, I I think with um with breaking, I, it's going to look a lot different. I do think overall it's good. I think it's good for singles. I think it's going to be good for pricing. Um, I hope that we are correct about pricing coming down a little bit. However, if it went the other direction, there's absolutely nothing anyone can do about it. Correct. That's a little scary. Well, I mean, it's been that way for years. There's been monopolies across the board. Upper Deck has a hockey monopoly. Um, Panini had football and uh, basketball monopoly. Mm -hmm. Tops had baseball. Yeah. Now, Fanatics has all of it except for hockey. And let's be honest, hockey is not what you would call a market driver. In the sport, in the, in the hobby. by and large, yeah, yeah there's some the hobby. big cards out oh, there. there are, well, I will tell you this: if you, the, most of our listeners are not hockey people. I'm not a huge hockey investor or collector either. However, Upper Deck Series Two hockey comes out in a month. I think February 28th is the release date. You could do a whole lot worse as a long term investment. The buying all of the retail blasters and megas of series two and just holding them that you can because Connor Bedard is in this in that release. Connor McDavid is probably the biggest modern hockey card of somebody who's still playing right now, his rookies. 2015 16 upper deck hockey was what he was in, his young guns card, which is the rookie card that guys look for um, between. Young Guns in in flagship upper deck hockey and then stuff from the cup, which mm -hmm. is like their flawless, their version of flawless. Um, those blasters now sell for 600 bucks a piece. Mm -hmm. Like you could do a lot worse than buying a bunch of upper deck series two hockeys and hockey blasters and megas and just mm -hmm. holding on to them. Yep. Yep. 
I know nothing about hockey cards. I, I've I've learned more than I ever wanted to simply because as somebody who sets up shows, I have guys who ask about it on the regular. So when there I go was to a places, podcast when I first started getting back into cards, a uh, guy that does ton, like he goes live and he's in the middle of like 20 eBay auctions and he's kind of given a play by play does tons of vintage hockey, which I will say this hockey enthusiasts. They might be greater historians than baseball enthusiasts, which is oh, saying a lot. Hockey fans are rabid. 1927, blah, blah, blah. Played 583 minutes before. Dental record break. shows his 12-year <laughs> molars never came in. Right? I'm guessing a puck took those out, too. Right. Uh, how do you know this? Yes. Uh, but, it, but it's pretty cool. So um, I'll tell you what, man. That's all I got. So is the goal that we've made our first purchase by the next episode? Yeah. Okay. I mean, we're both set up for the show Now, tomorrow. I'm not saying that Gary is um, shady, but as soon as I agreed to this, he pulled up a photo of a card he already had. No, with a contact. I don't have it yet. What is it comp at? It doesn't have any comps. Where would you comp it if you were selling it tomorrow at the show? $140. Oh, $40? That's 40% margin. Do you think that's really where it is? Yeah. Quad patch, flawless, what? Uh, to 25 Okay. We'll see. Maybe he gets it. Maybe he doesn't. Hopefully, I uh, I will participate this time because you guys don't want to hear me not do that. All right. Day. So, uh, yeah, that's that's all I got. I know I've been a little grumpy today, but it's all right. there's it still happens. time for it to turn around. Maybe I just need food. <laughs> it never hurts. This has been the Ball Card Show, the Sports Podcast. For the Sports Collector. Bye now. Peace. Peace.